because people will say to me you're lucky you've got genetics or you're lucky you're this you're lucky you're like Luke's brother I was like, yeah, I'm lucky but also off cameras I'm we're probably one of the hardest workers in the sport and that's all it is it's, there's no shortcuts it's just basically be the greatest of all time go prove that you want to be it and if it doesn't happen it doesn't happen but you've given your 100% every single year and you've given 100% to every single goal you want to do Welcome back to the Mulligan Brothers. I am your host, Jordan Mulligan, and today's interview is with my good friend and two times World's Strongest Man, Tom Stoltman, one half of the World's Strongest Brothers. We've been following the Stoltman Brothers now for three years, and their story has been incredible. We've been shooting a feature-length documentary that is almost ready to share with the world. I watched one of the drafts yesterday, and I was laughing and crying throughout and I was inspired and motivated. Honestly, I cannot wait to share this film with you. So if you head down below to the Stoltman Brothers documentary page, you can get updates on there. And also all of this has been made possible, including the feature length film at mulliganbrothers.com. That is how we fly our film crew all around the world. The brand new Memento Mori poster is now available. Use code STOIC at checkout for 10% off. It's a poster of 80 years worth of tiny little squares that you shade in every week. And I look at it and I'm reminded that one day I will die. If that does not get you motivated, I do not know what will. So if that sounds good to you, head down below and use the link in the description. But before that, Tom Stoltman, two times world's strongest man. Somebody who has empowered hundreds of thousands of people by his views on what some people may call a disability. And Tom has flipped it around and changed it to a superpower. One of my favorite, favorite quotes that Tom has said is in this video. If that sounds good to you, hang around till the end. Let's dive into the video. Tom, uh, for those who don't know, just introduce yourself and what you do. I'm Tom Stoltman, professional strongman, two-time world's strongest man. And I, know, I know we've covered this loads of times before, but so a lot of this is gonna be used to sort of talk about you, showcase sort of who's gonna be featured in a documentary. Um, we've been working on the Mulligan Brothers, Stoltman Brothers documentary for three years now, is it? It's three years, three l brilliant years, eh? <laughs> three long years. Um, but like, yeah, so for anyone who doesn't know, whereabouts did you grow up? How would you describe this beautiful town that we're in as well? Yeah, so obviously grew up basically next door to here, 10 yards away from here, uh, at the back of Invergordon, basically New Moor, so quiet place no one really about here either so it was nice just to have a big, big garden we could play in when we were kids oh, f there was five of us as well so we just plenty of entertainment and plenty of things to do when you have a massive garden and yeah our mum and dad that loved just loved us and just cared for us and just let us play whatever do whatever we want we could go outside without their kind of permission or their eyes on us because there was no like, roads or anything around us uh, yeah, I'm being in front of Invergordon, I mean, it's a small, small place and growing up for me, obviously, with autism and stuff, a bit harder. Um, but I think being in kind of isolated, I was, I felt safe because I isolated myself away from people in my house anyway. So then, you know, going out to the street in Invergordon, which was probably max 50, 60 people you'd see on it at once, was very easy for myself. Going to shops was very easy up here. Um, and then even going to school, you know, when I went to school, it was like 50 people, I think, in my whole school um, anymore, and probably about 15 in my class. So again, that was just, felt like I was just around the, my family. My family are big, so it just felt like I was around a dinner table with my family. So it kind of really helped me with the autism and really kind of, yeah, just being up here, I think I coped more than I would if I was in a big city and growing up in a big city. And I think mindset as well really helped me to get a strong mindset and just really helped me to adapt in kind of out, out, out of school life and you know in business life and meeting people and stuff, meeting new people. It just really helped me kind of blossom, I think, as a person. So. Um, yeah, for, for a lot of people, when they hear autism, they're not too sure how it affects people. And they're not too sure what it even means. Like, what's your experience with it? And do you, how would you describe it to somebody just like who, who had no, no knowledge of it whatsoever? I mean, yeah, autism is it's a weird thing because it says it affects people. Everyone that's got autism, it's, they're affected differently. Um, I think growing up for me with autism, I think people just thought I was kind of maybe a bit of ADHD and, you know, shy. They just kind of thought that, you know, because obviously I think being in a, a smaller place and having a small school and stuff, you know, it, it was, I think, it, all, all the kids were hyper. Everyone misbehaved and stuff, so I just kind of felt normal. But autism, I think... 
you know, if you're trying to explain it to someone that didn't have it, I think it's just, I mean, it's hard to to explain. I think the people that need to kind of, that don't have it, have to actually physically see it. I think that's really helped the people that didn't understand it for me. When they did understand it, they really, when they seen it, because I had like friends to grow up from what, primary one all the way into secondary school. They knew when I was kind of in primary school, I acted a bit different, but they just thought it was kind of, you know, misbehaving. But then when I got into like older and older and older, the more they were with me, the more they were kind of questioning stuff and saying like, why is this, why is that? And then when I actually told them, they understood it. So I think, yeah, it's hard to explain it to someone that doesn't know about it because it's basically like a mask, isn't it? Like nobody knows I have autism because there's nothing physically strong with me, it's just mentally. But I think people do understand that when, you know, you start isolating yourself away from people when you're, you know, you don't want to be with everybody else. You want to be just alone all the time. And then that's when I think people start understanding there's more to Tom just being shy. There's more to Tom just being this or he's got some sort of like additional needs. So yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's really hard to explain, but I think that's kind of what it is. You know, for me as well, like I said, I don't look like it at all. And I think because I had, because I live in such a small place as well. And I think, you know, it was, it was kind of ignored for a long, long time because like I said, I was just around really hyper kids. I played sport the same as everybody else in, in my school, in primary school. I was quite, I wasn't at the lowest, I was in the middle. So I was just like, I kind of acted like a normal kid and treated like a normal kid. And I only kind of ever felt autistic when I was with family because that's when I did my, that's when I felt safe and could, you know, have my meltdowns and that. So yeah, it was really hard. I think, like I said, on the outside, you know, it's it was really hard for people to understand it because I never ever acted in an autistic way in front of random people and that's why I needed like that's why my mum and dad needed the proof for the teachers and you know other people like that because they never believed me until I did these actions so until I think you physically see it that's when you understand wow that's that's why he needs this help and stuff so, so one of the things that you've said loads of times and I've seen it impact loads of people as well like it's really helped a lot of people is the Autism for you is a superpower. So how how is autism a superpower? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I kind of started saying autism is a superpower the last few years. I think I've kind of experienced. I think when you've experienced autism, you had it like a label. You know, like when you get called an autistic child, for anybody that's you know that bad, it's like you know I was getting called autistic, or he has a label, or you know, and, and people don't believe that you've got. This problem where you're just trying to you're just trying to act, act, act for attention uh, all this kind of stuff really can affect you mentally you know and obviously in primary school it was all right, right but mentally teachers would say to you know, like I said teachers would not believe in you they would kind of give up on you and work of other people like I said they'd say oh maybe when like I'm had my mum and dad had meetings or other people had meetings or Tom's autistic you know like and when I'm in that room hearing that it's like they're basically labeling you and telling you telling you you're worthless so I think it was when I kind of started the gym, even, not even when I started the gym, like the last three or four years, like I said, when I started working with more professional people and really understanding my mindset um, to then flip it. Because I, I, I used to always think autism took over my life and I used to always, even you know, when I left school, even when I started the gym, you know, I'm, I'm this different kid and I'm autistic and stuff. And yeah, maybe when I was 22, 23, started a straw man, started getting better and I was like, you know, I need to, I've got autism, I've got it for the rest of my life. I need to be able to control it and control it in a way that'll inspire me, but maybe help other people. And then saying it's a superpower. I mean, it is a basically a superpower because like only a percent of people in the world has this and every single person that has it is smart in their own way. Like Albert Einstein, for example, the smartest guy in the world and stuff. And then, you know, other people like you look up so many famous people that have autism and they were at the top of what they did or they were some of the smartest people in the world and that's a superpower in itself. So, yeah, I think it just, when I started working with professionals to help my mind, I just wanted to say that this is a superpower and I just wanted to know that kids, I wanted to help kids before they got into school that, you know, in school you're going to get called autistic, in school you're going to get called this, but if you get call it your superpower yourself, you'll be able to rise above that and you know, you'll live with it, you'll be able to maybe talk sooner than I did, you'll be able to just help people around you, people understand you, and it just, it'll just give you that better life as you're growing up in, in school and stuff. So yeah, that's why I kind of changed it into, from it being like a negative effect to people to a positive and superpower. You can do anything you want in your life, 
even if you've got this kind of super, even if you've got this additional need, change it into a superpower and you can be the greatest thing in the world. Because like I said, it's an absolutely amazing thing when you control it. And I think it's a cheat code for a lot of people and a lot of think, a lot of people that have it. I think can say the same thing as well. So. For, for me, one of the biggest things that I've seen with you since the last three years was that it was a superpower for you in the way that everything you genuinely believe that you are capable of doing, you literally achieve it. But it's almost like a limiting factor. So like you need to believe you're going to win. And if you believe you're going to win, you're going to win. Um, 20, 2020, you said you was going to come podium at Worlds and then you came podium 2021 you said you was going to win 2022 you said you was going to win and like it's not even that it's like Britain's Strongest Man you called it like all of these competitions like people talk about Conor McGregor like Mystic Mac but like the way in which you've predicted to win is so uncanny especially with I think 2019 or whichever it was you said you was going to get to the finals Um, so like the concrete thinking and the belief that it's going to happen for you, once you believe it, that's it. If, as long as you can get that self-belief, how hard is it to get the self-belief? Like, we're going into 2023 now. It'd be a three-peat. One of the first, like, one, one of the first Brits to ever do it, or the first yeah, Brit to ever do it. Yeah, and one of only three people yeah. to, to ever do it. And probably one of the youngest, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty, so it's a very, very tall order, three-peat. How have you... How have you gained the belief that you're going to do this now? Yeah, I mean, you obviously, I mean, I, the thing is, I have to take confidence into from the last two years. I think, you know, when I say uh, one world strongest man, I think I've dominated the last two years. Even in 2020, I look back at, like, before I won it, and one mistake cost me the title. So that's how I kind of picture world strongest man is like, I believe it's, it's my event, and it's my kind of, yeah, it's my title to lose, and I believe that like out of all the straw men in the world that I'm the best at this kind of four five day event so it's just <laughs> it's more just uh I, w- I just kind of draw a picture in my head and go and just kind of always visualize like you know me being on top of that podium and that just keeps me motivated and that's why I never put trophies in my eyesight because if I had trophies in my house um and like someone said to me, you're going to win it in 2023. I wouldn't believe it in myself because I've already done two. So I was like, why do I put my body through for the third? But yeah, it's just as long as I have a plan and I have sitting visual saying world strongest man written in front of me every single day, that I know that what I'm achie- what I'm striving towards. Because so if I don't have a goal, it's really hard for myself. And uh, yeah, my my goal is to obviously win three in a row. And I think if I win three in a row. I could probably say that I'm one of the greatest from at World Strongest Man to ever do it, and then, yeah, to be in that kind of, what is it, Bill Casmer and Magnus Van Magnussen have done it, to be with those two guys would be unbelievable. But yeah, I think it's just, like I said, you said concrete thinking. When I when I have a goal, nothing else will distract me, so everything else will go to the side, and it'll be one big tunnel to go to get to that goal, and that's that's I think why I think I'm so dominant about it, and I don't want anybody else to have that goal title because. Like I say, I glance it when I go to my dad's, I glance it when I go past it in the shop, and I have a smile, and like, these two titles are mine. Like, no one else in the world's gonna get these titles off me, so. They, they talk about, there's a, the, an analogy, the, the wolf at the top of the hill is, or the wolf at the top of the mountain is not as hungry as the wolf climbing the mountain. So like, in, a, in essence, with the trophies, like getting rid of the trophies, you're back on, you're back climbing the hill again. You're keeping that hunger. Like is that is that a part of it? Like to to stay grounded, to stay hungry, like not to like feel like right at the top kind of. I mean, I think for me, I think it's the opposite because I, I I heard that last year after my Arnold's performance that uh, oh Tom's not got it, he's not as hungry because he's at the top. And for me, when I seen that, I was just like, shit, let's win it. You know, like that's me. That's when the mindset changed. I was like, I said to her that day, I texted her saying, look at this, look at these keyboard warriors. Let's just go win World Strongest Man and make a statement. And I did that. So. I honestly think me being at the top is, is I'm more hungry being at the top because I've got all these guys trying to fight me to get this title and I won't give it up until, unless I'm dead. And I think that's what pushes me. If I'm chasing somebody else, it might not push me as much. And I think you've seen the fight with me and Novikov this year. Like Novikov was three or four points in front, but I knew mentally that he's going to 
make a mistake and he's going to drain himself out and he was the one chasing the wolf at the top of the mountain and that was me and I ended up winning it again so I think me being at the top of the mountain makes me just as hungry as I would be if I was climbing or even more hungry and that's what it came from last year and I seen someone wrote that under my comment and I was like yeah you little keyboard warrior let's see what happens then and it shut them up you know I don't heard from them since so but yeah I think yeah so I think you see that with a lot of sports like you said not everybody that's achieved something at the top and there's always people behind you that are chasing you but for me like that's why I don't have my trophies around me you know when I, I only have my trophies around me when I stop competing and then when I'm complacent on what I've done that's when every all the trophies will come out and uh, they'll be more kind of visual to myself but right now yeah, I feel like I'm. I don't. I'm not world's strongest man because I don't have that trophy beside me. So I'm still always, always hungry to be the world's strongest man. So. I love that, but you know people are still chasing you because of that. Yeah, yeah, and that's 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 what, again what gets me hyped up because you know you want to you want to be going into world's strongest man 100%. And you want the other competitors to be 100%. So if they're seeing me pushing. I want them to push even more, and I want like the best 30 to have a big army to come across. And it's me versus 29 people. Let's see who wins. You know. Just if anyone's wondering as well, just to put this out there for anyone who's watching the full interview, me and Tom aren't crying. We've got a fire pit and it's like, it's blowing smoke in our eyes. It's quite, uh, it's quite intense. It's, I, mean, the, I mean, the story is, the story is like the three years. I think the reason we started working together is because we, we sat down over breakfast, we'd done a YouTube video and then we'd sat down over breakfast and the way in which you said you were going to win World's Strongest Man, like I fully believed you. That was it, like I fully believed it. And then we were like, right, we'll follow you then. And I think you said, you laid down the plan there and then, like next year I'm gonna do podium, the year after I'm gonna win World's Strongest Man. And I mean, I have it on video as evidence, <laughs> like it, it happened, like, um, and it is, it's a, the, the journey's absolutely crazy. In fact, the, the one thing I wanted to touch on is those training sessions where you would, you say about like, you would say World's Strongest Man, but like, again, I've got it on film, like you were holding, I think it was the hammer hold. You're holding the hammer hold out and you're screaming World's Strongest Man. Like, do you remember, have you watched um, the Arnold documentary where he's like, oh, no, Lou, Lou Ferrigno is shouting Arnold yeah, as he's, yeah. as he's do, working out. And you do that whilst you're working out, you say World's Strongest Man all the yeah. time. Like, what is that doing when, you, when you're saying that? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's the thing I wanted to, I wanted to get a word that motivated me. I think saying other people in competitor, in Canberra competitors, is you're, they're living in rent fee in your head. So, like I knew that my weaker events, like the kind of Hercules hold, that kind of stuff, I just wanted to know when, when it gets tough that, you know, if I squeeze and stout world strongest man, that I'm just going to, like, it's not, I'm not going to let go. Like, I'm not going to let go of the trophy. Like, if I had a, the trophy in my hand when I was doing fr f uh, front hold, and they said, like, if you drop that, it smashes and you've lost it. And so I thought the hammer was a trophy. I was like, world strongest man, world strongest man, world strongest man. Yeah, and I think it helped me with another five or six seconds. So, yeah, that... These simple words like that really just help me to get motivated. I don't need anything else like shouting all these special things. It's just literally, well, strong as man, and then I'll hold it from a dear life. So, I think um, when you speak about the way you are, I feel like you simplify it, and a lot of people maybe they associate or maybe they think, oh, it's not a big thing. But I mean, you are literally the top of the top. Like, you know, the 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 best in the sport, going to be one of the greatest of all time. And with the mindset element of that, I don't think people realise how elite you are. I mean, when, what goes through your head when you're thinking about competing? Like, what is, what is your mindset to be the best in the world? Yeah, I mean, obviously, my mindset's been the thing that's really struggled. Um, like, you know, like three, four years ago when I met you, it was probably weaker than it was now, but it's... <laughs> It's a thing because I, get, I do get scared when I compete. Like I, you know, sometimes I sit in my room, I sit in the house, and go, "Wow, I've got worlds in four weeks, and like this could make or break me." You know, like so. But I always just try and. But my mindset, for I think the reason I'm at, I'm at the top of the sport and um, I can I'm so good at controlling my now, now, now is because I think I just have that balance and keep it uh, keep calm. And when I'm not in the gym or when I'm not doing anything to do with kind of lifting I don't ever think about that and I think that's really really helped me because you know two three four years ago even I would would wake up at say 8 a.m think about the gym nine think about the gym ten think about the gym and it would oh, I think overstimulate me and that was a really really bad thing for me especially with autism so I think for me now it's kind of just learning I've just learned to kind of write in the gym is what it, it's my job 
in the business is my job, but then after that, it's just concentrate on Sinead, concentrate on family, and that's helped my mindset kind of really kind of have that balance, but also not to overload it all. And I think that's really helped me to get to the elite kind of side of stone because you see a lot of athletes online, strongman, strength athletes especially, and they're really their mindset's really they're over. They're always saying like about. Oh, I always have to think about the gym. I'm thinking about the gym 24/7. If I said that, I'd lie. Like I think about the gym only when I'm in the gym, and I'll think about World Show's man. Yeah, every day, but it's it's written for me, and I think that's the mindset I do. Once I see that WSM on the on the whiteboard, I won't think about it again for the rest of the day. So it's a weird, it's a weird kind of mindset for myself, but it's a mindset that's helped me, and. I don't think I'll ever change it, even in the training, you know, when I've gone into training, I mean, I don't train like a world strongest man, I train like a guy that's just started out in the gym and I'm probably, like, I, I, but I only never put 60-70% effort in it because I don't, I believe that training, the name is in, it, in, in itself, training's training, you don't ever want to perform, like, you know, if you're at the top of the sport, I'm, gonna, I'm training, I'm trying to get better, I'm trying to improve my technique, I'm just trying to maintain, so... I always go about 70%. When you go to the competition, that's when you take your whole package and go, right, this is where I perform. So, again, I think that having that mindset of being able to to know when to kind of go up, to know when to go down, to know that when I have bad days, it's just a bad day. I'm not I'm not going weak and starting. All this kind of stuff helps being that elite kind of mindset. Because, you know, when I have a bad day, I go home and go maybe think about it for 10 minutes. And I'm like, geez, this has been a really bad day. But then I have to remember... It's only a bad day. Let's just wake up then tomorrow and restart fresh. So all that kind of stuff really helped me to get to the top of the sport. I think that's where you've been the the biggest change has happened because I think when we first met, it was a real huge obsession. Like it, and I think you like you said you over overstimulated with it. Um, and I think over the years that the biggest. I would say success that you've had is being able to do exactly what you want in life, to be able to go watch football, spend time with your family, go on holiday, and then also be the world's strongest man. Like, I don't think people realize the most dominant performance in strongman history, the week before you was out in Seville, Seville. watching Rangers, and you was like, you got dehydrated, like bad, bad things happened. But like the the idea of not going out to Rangers and having that thing that you that you're passionate about as well and you enjoy probably would have had a, more of a negative effect than the dehydration. But that's how elite you were. Like you could go out to do that. Things didn't go great whilst you was out there in terms of like yeah that you were dehydrated and the, you weren't treated very nicely. But then a week later you're out at World Strongest Man with the most dominant performance in history. Like talk us through that. Yeah, I mean you've really nailed hit nailed the head of I. I honestly think if I didn't go to that game, I would have come with that world story, man, because I, I think people know that football's a massive thing to me, Rangers are a massive thing, and that's my mechan- coping mechan- mechanism away from world straws, away from straw man. You know, Luke's is the beach and cold water and showing out, but you know, when, when they got to the final, I was like, yeah, I'm going 100%. I don't care if world straw is man is 10 hours afterwards, I will fly there and fly to uh, world straw as man. But for me, I just kind of thought it in my head, right, I'm going to go watch my football team in a foreign country, in a hot country that's going to help me climatise to World Straws, man. I'm going to be getting really nice food over there. May not be drinking as much as I want, but I'm still... The worst thing that happened to me was dehydration, and I, you know, by the last day I was, you know, it was fine, but I got more food than I thought I would get. I was in the sun, chilling beside a pool, basically doing R&R, and then just going to go watch a football game. You know, and that was really helped my mindset because of all Rangers lost. I was with Sinead, I was with people that I've met over the year at Rangers. Didn't really kind of talk about anything to do with Strawman, literally. I think people forgot I was competing at World Strawman, man. And then, yeah, as soon as, as soon as that kind of time was over, I literally went home and was like, yeah, I'm ready for Worlds. Flew out that, I think it was like 24 hours later, I flew out and was kind of ready. But I think that really kind of just relaxed me and really just proved that, yeah, like you said, elite mindset. You know, I think people ripped me off then. They thought oh, I was going to go over there and party and do stuff, but... When you're elite, it's just I'm literally just going to another country to watch football, but a country that's probably as hot as America, and really played into my favour. What's let's let's take it back to I think one of the biggest inspirations you've done is is teaching kids with autism that they have a superpower. But like, what's the one sort of 
structure that you would give them to say like if, if they're in a position where they're struggling with it right now they feel outcast how would you say like this is how you maybe could go about it to feel better about it to start using it to your advantage yeah i mean for me the biggest thing would be kind of to have a plan in your life i mean it doesn't plans don't always go together but i think you know as my whole life i can remember i know i've had i've had a plan of what you know what time I go to school, what time this was, blah, blah, blah. And I think that's really important to take everywhere you go. So, you know, if you, if it's kids that are, you know, just starting maybe secondary school and they're scared to go into that bigger school, I think, you know, sitting down with parents and teachers and having that kind of plan written out to know where you're going to be in the school, what classes you're going to be and who you're going to be around is very, very important as well. And, uh, and yeah, that then just leads, I think planning, planning really just stops people stops kids and stops from overstimulating and uh, will really help them to know uh, their way around the school, the way around life and it just really helps you in the day to day life and when you're getting older and older uh, I've been planning, I plan for my whole life and that's that's the thing that's really helped me um, from a young age that's what my mum and dad did, that's what my sisters helped me with, Luke helped me with and yeah, planning is, a, is probably the most important thing I could say to someone that has autism and also to be open about it, like you know, you talk about people trying to hide it because they don't want to have a label, but that's why I'm trying to say it's a superpower. Be proud of it. There will be sitting. I guarantee the people that are, have autism will be better than be better sitting that, that these normal kids aren't at. And that's the thing you need to kind of you know rely on. If someone's really good at maths, go take advantage of that and you know really show your skills and be proud that you've got this superpower that's helping you achieve your maths or whatever it is in life. But yeah, I think starting with a plan is very, very important. And then working your life out, working your, li your life sorry, around that plan is the thing that really helps kids or you know older people with autism. So. The, uh, the st on the idea of plan, what does it, like your morning routine look like? Yeah, so for me, it's again, I wake up 7 a.m. every morning, have breakfast at 8 a.m. every morning, and then go to the office for an hour, then go back home just really chill out with Sinead from like maybe 11 till 1 o'clock have my lunch then go to the gym 2 o'clock, 2 in the gym maybe till 4, go back home and then just chill out the whole night and uh, like, that's what I do is, as it comes, the competition gets closer I go less and less into the office and I really just focus on family time and that's, if, if, something does, if something changes in my plan um, I'll add that into my I've got a plan written on my uh, whiteboard in the kitchen so if something changes or we take something out or say for example I'm adding like I'm injured and I'm adding rehabbing it every day that'll be added in as long as it's added in even to this day I have to visually, visually be able to see it so yeah my morning routine is nice and simple waking up having breakfast chilling out for a wee while going to the office doing a few things and then just relaxing I really need to relax at about 10 11 o'clock that's really important for myself so I love it. Talking about the mentality when you get into the gym, I've, I remember um, it wasn't Conan's wheel, it was the, the train push in 2021. And you told me like you, how you went to sort of like a dark place. Like it, if somebody was going for a big lift, like lifetime PR and deadlift, like some, somewhere where they really needed to draw something, what, what would you do? What would you advise them to do? Or what do you do to, to get that that one thing done. Yeah, that's that's good because it, it's good that people can ask me that now because I used to be, I ask people that because I never ever was able to go to that dark place. But yeah, for me, I think the darkest place I go to is on Atlas Stones. Um, I think that each family member of mine is under that Atlas Stone. Uh, so well, no, I say like Sinead's under the heaviest one. Then it's my dad. Then it's my mum. That's that's three. And then it's like my two brothers. Uh, and it's basically, if I don't lift them, they're dead. So I basically, it sounds bad, but I'm basically killing my whole, fam whole fa my, my whole family just because I can't lift this rock off them. And that's, it's really dark because I don't do that every event, but I think for me, the Atlas Stones, it's just a thing that like, I just go back to like the olden times where like people had to lift things off their loved ones and stuff. And I really just think like, you know, I, I, I visualize it, so I visualize yeah, it sounds really bad, but I, I visualise like my brother, my my uh, wife, Harry screaming. I visualise them all screaming, and in my head I'm just like, right, these stones are going to get absolutely like just. I'm just going to kill these stones and do it as fast as I can because the faster I do it, 
they have a better chance to have a surviving. So yeah, I really, I, I, I like to go into dark places, but I like to have my family involved with it because family's a big motivation for myself. And I know that, you know, if, if I'm in a life or death situation with my family and someone's stuck under something, I'll lift it no matter what. Doesn't matter how heavy it is. And that's how I process that into like these Atlas stones or, uh, it's even a, I think for me it's more a lot of rep work so if I'm like even deadlifting for reps that's when more when the kind of dark things come out um, and say like oh, if I don't lift more, this more than 10 times Sinead's dead you know so it's yeah it's, it's brutal but it, it works for myself so I don't do that in every event because it gets me it really emotional it gets me too kind of drained out afterwards but those are kind of the main event I do that in is at the stone so it's, it's so funny you say that. I was talking to my brother Luke actually recently, and I, I didn't I didn't want to admit it, but like that's exactly with Atlas Stones, maybe deadlifts or Atlas Stones, but definitely Atlas Stones. I I have a phrase in my head and it's helped me, and it's I'm imagining Jude's voice, and I I, I hate to admit it, but like. I think especially with Atlas Stones, like there's it's such a painful lift as well. Like you need to be able to just go to that like pure instinctive part of you where you're just going to get it up no matter what like it doesn't it doesn't matter what what pain it causes yeah, I you've think got to get it up. people say it's oh it's hard doing that but yeah it's like you said you know it's it's life or death really you know if you, i think if that, that that's the only thing that motivates me to get the stone up if i just said if i went into at the stones with a kind of aggressive mindset i'd be like if i fail this it's fine like if i go in and say oh 200k if i fail it, it's fine whereas like even when I'm training, I have that mindset of someone's under that stone, someone's under that stone, someone's under that stone, keep doing that. And that just help, yeah, helps me, I think, rip it off the, the ground faster and better than everybody else because I've got that image of someone under it, you know? So. You say life or death. I remember when you was doing the 286, you was training with the 286. And like a lot of people don't know that you was repping on the 286, which was the world record at the time. And I think you was going up for the second or third rep and you hung on to the stone so much, so I don't know what you'd put on it, but you hung on to the stone so much that it almost crushed you afterwards. Like you literally crumbled underneath it. Luckily, as you fell, you kind of like pushed yourself away. But like, when, so when you've committed to lifting the stone, is that it? Like, would you, like, are you talking, like you'll go to a place where you'll die underneath the stone? Like you're just gonna go yeah, that far? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what you do. It's like you either kill the person you love or you'll die yourself. And you know, in anybody's heads, that you, you want you, you take your life for for your loved ones, and that's yeah how I feel. Like, I mean, especially with the two eight six training. I mean, that was the most brutal training cycle I've ever done, and like that's even to go to that like getting doubles at two eight six. Even that that really took a beating on my body. But I was just saying the same thing. You know, I had Sinead face under there. It's either me or her, and you know I'd rather it be me because I'm the man. I've like achieved what I've, I've achieved a lot of things in my life. Let's just do it. You know. So. If you're enjoying this interview with Tom Stoltman, please head over to mulliganbrothers.com where you can now get the new Memento Mori poster using code STOIC for 10% off, a poster that reminds you that you will one day die. If that doesn't get you motivated, I don't know what will. Head to the link in the description. But before that, let's dive back into the interview. And it is like, for people who don't know, I don't know if we can put the footage up, but yeah, Tom with a 286, like, you did almost get crushed by that stone, I remember. You, went, you came back the next week and managed to, I think you hit the reps yeah, the yeah. week after, didn't you? Um, I, yeah, it's incredible. So, I mean, just talking about training philosophies as well, like, how would you encapsulate your training philosophy? Uh, what do you mean by that? Like, what, when, when you enter in the gym, like, what's your, your mindset? Obviously, that's, that's how you go to a dark place. Like, that's the one, that's where you go for the big, big lifts. But on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. Uh, I mean, like I said, for me with training, I try and keep it as, I mean, they're serious, but I can't keep it as fun as I as I want, you know, because for me, I really do not like training. I don't really enjoy it. The only training I kind of enjoy is the, the straw man event stuff, but I know that the other stuff I do in the week helps towards that. So, you know, I walk when I walk into the gym, it's more, yeah, I'll probably, I mean, it sounds bad saying it, but I'll probably give about 60 to 70% effort, but I'll have, I'll never be, I'll never ever be as aggressive as I am in the gym as I am in competition and people can see that I just go into the gym I think that's why <laughs> as well I fail I kind of fail a lot of lifts because I'm too kind of laid back but it's just kind of how my mindset is because I don't really like I hate to um, I hate to have that dark aggressive mindset all the time because then after the gym I'm really drained and it just ain't good for you know family life and it ain't good for 
you know, going back home with the wife. I'd rather ha keep that. It's like, for me, that mindset is kind of like you, when you open the lid off a, you know, a can of coat or just you open the can, boom, that's when you've got like that half an hour to use it and that's it. But yeah, for me, it's just day to day, nice and chilled. Obviously, I'm there with Luke, so the good thing about us training together is well, we can have that banter with each other and um, we can just, we just, you know, we have really good energy that we fly off each other. But even Luke as well, he has more fun in the gym than obviously at competitions. And that's where you can have fun and that's where, you know, you can just let your mindset relax and I think it's all about again building the aggression slowly in the gym so you're you know you peak physically but you have to peak mentally as well so it's learning just to that's why I go into the gym every day with just a positive and clear uh, chilled out mindset because I'm trying to peak it up to the next to the to the next competition so one of the most interesting things about you and Luke is that you you could be in the the gym a couple of weeks before a competition <laughs> A week before a competition, let's say we take take the 286 or something, you maybe maybe you hit it for a single, and then when you get to comp day, something comes out of you guys where you could you could hit it for a triple. Like what what are you doing to get that extra bit out in competition? Yeah, and I think uh, I think it's really down to the to the mindset as well. I think you know I think I can probably honestly say like with all the like say for example in training, I'll probably give. It'll probably feel like I'm giving a hundred percent, but I probably know in my heart that I'm only giving 80, 90 percent, and I'm not probably willing to try and like kill myself for three or four reps in the gym where I could injure myself. Whereas, in when you're, you know, when you've had that deload week, and when you're like itching itching to get back in, you're like a man, uh, 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 you're like a man obsessed. You want, you just want to rip something out to part, and then when you have the crowd, the adrenaline, you have these other athletes like. That around you, you just want to go. Right, I'm going to go and absolutely destroy this, and no matter what. And that's where I think you get. I can get that extra ten or twenty percent. And that's when I think my mindset is also really fresh and a hundred percent because I've not used hardly any aggression, hardly any of that dark thoughts in the gym. I've all, I've kept it all bottled up to comp day, just like I have my physical as aspects. I'm you know I'm deloaded. I'm fresh. Mindset's fresh. So let's go. So. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a personal question here then. So we're we're going out to Arnold's soon um, in a few weeks to go shoot the documentary. Myself and Neva are gonna come along, and uh, I've I've also on after the competition, I'm gonna be doing the uh, the Atlas Stone over bar. And I'll be honest with you, my training didn't go this that well this week. I was hoping to hit bigger numbers this week, um, but on competition day, what would you advise me to get a little bit extra out on that day? Yeah, I mean, I think. I think the hardest thing as well is, like you just said there, the, the training week before it, like that's, I think people, if you have a negative week, people, you can kind of look and go, right, am I capable of doing this? Am I going to fail? Am I not even going to get a rep? But I always look at it that it's a deload is the most important thing before you train, so, uh, before you go out there, sorry. So, you know, like me as well, like I've probably not had the best few sessions training, but I know if I get a really good deload, the deload for me is where you win or, win or lose a competition. I think if you deload properly, and you know you stick to the deload, and by the by the Thursday or Friday, you're literally like you're wanting to rip someone apart. That's when you know, like if you know someone's annoying you, that, that shouldn't that doesn't really annoy you, or sitting or you're, people are saying things that don't annoy you, and you're getting annoyed. That's when you're right, right. You're physically ready, but then I think mentally, I think you know, I've done the the, the Stone World record out at Arnold's, and when I kind of did it, you know, when I was backstage, I was just cool just cool and I, I was just taking my time with my warm-up I just basically visualized my gym and uh, you know obviously I've got the same uh, same bit of equipment that I put the stone over so I basically just thought I was in the backyard of my gym and I was just lifting an the stone with my friends and that's how I just did it in, tr in, in the backstage and I kind of just you know I took my time I think they said that I only ever kind of switched on about 20 minutes before I think you know obviously doing a record breaker it's hard because it's just one one event and again it's going to be I think really with those kind of events it's mental more than physical I think obviously physically you know yourself you could probably lift it for reps and reps but it's how you go into that mentally and I think keeping a cool head and uh, not just not thinking about it as a world record I think just going into it like it is training like you're doing like it's basically a, a training you visualise the stone you visualise the bar you put it over it's not a different a piece of equipment it's basically the bar and all you're doing is lifting the stone up you're lifting it again you're lifting it again and with the crowd there and I think 
what also helps is the people you're against. They'll push you. If, if, if someone does one rep off the, the stone, you'll then go, right, I'll do two reps no matter what. But if someone, if no one does it, I think you get less motivated to do a rep. But that's what was, you know, happened to me, 265. I didn't expect anybody to do it. They came out and I was like, oh, shh, oh, crap. And I was like, that, that got me then really, yeah, I suppose this is a competition. Let's do it. Let's battle to the end. And that's then when you can get a bit more motivated as well. But, yeah, staying chilled, staying relaxed, and then switching on. 15 minutes before you go out is the best way to do it. And then switching straight back up afterwards, not kind of keeping that high for so long, trying to get back down to it and chilled out is the best way to be. So. I love that. I'm going to take that advice. Uh, what time are we on, Neve? Because I feel like Tom's getting... 41, Tom's getting... Right, we've got about 19 minutes left. I'm not, I'm not coping very well with this fire. This was uh, my idea, so I'm to blame for it looking like me and Tom have cried the whole time. We've not. Um, yeah, just so lastly, with, with this, like uh, the peak week, what, what makes the perfect peak? Like, what makes that perfect final week of, of training prep before yeah, uh, I think, competition? I think, I think usually, like, the last so if you're like three weeks out from a competition, I think the last one, one and a half weeks of heavy training is probably the hardest because your body's already kind of beaten up and you're not going to get any stronger. And that's, I think, the hardest thing mentally is like. In the, week, the one and a half weeks out maybe someone will miss a rep or you'll miss it and then you'll think in your head wow I've got weaker but it's because your body's gone to that kind of limits and it's just ready to kind of collapse and you just you really need that deload week and that's yeah that's I think mentally can affect a lot of people because they're just like wow I've still three weeks out from a competition I'm failing these lifts and then like when you get to the deload week for me I'm looking forward to a deload week because my body's been through the wars and I know that if I don't if I do Monday to Friday and I do the deload a week exactly how it is, like I have been every other competition, I know by the time I fly out to Arnold's, I'll be itching to get back into the gym. I'll be mentally refreshed, physically refreshed. And I think, like I said, it's the deload. I think it's the deload that helps you win it. And a lot of people deload and go in and do like 200 kg deadlifts. That's still putting a lot of strain on your body. It's really just taking it down to 100k and getting as fast and aggressive as you can free exercises, you choose what you do, you go out to the gym, 10 minutes that you're in the gym, you're out 10 minutes later, and then, yeah, deload's the most important, reset your mindset, and then reset yourself physically, and just be really itching. So usually by the fifth day of deload, I'm like wanting to kill Sinead, I'm wanting to kill everybody, I'm just really like itching to get going, and that's when you then know you've had a successful deload. If you're your second last day of your deload and you're fatigued, Mentally, you're still fatigued physically. You've obviously not done your deload right, or you've missed you've missed setting out. That's the key to help you get to that kind of sweet point and that peak point. And that's you'll know when you've peaked because yeah, it'll hit it'll hit you hard with that kind of aggression. So this this week for me was my second to last heavy session. What would what would you change now at this point? Like what what would you be looking at getting one last heavy session in, or would you try and get two? Last, would you squeeze an extra session in? What would you do? Yeah, I mean for me, if that was you know because I always try and. From my mind, I was trying end on a positive. So, the, the, for my Friday's event session was a positive. So, uh, if I didn't train at all again, I'd be happy. But uh, because, like I said to you, you know, it's same with you. You know, you may have a bad session, but it's your body's probably telling you. I mean, if you're injuring yourself, your knees and stuff are obviously packing in. Your body's telling you you're not going to get stronger. The only thing you're going to do from now is either get injured, yeah, get yourself injured. So it's like, I think with that kind of stuff as well like you know for me I've got I think three or four more heavy or two more heavy sessions left but I'll go into the gym and if I don't feel like doing heavy I'll just take it back down and maybe do some speed stuff I think the same with the Atlas Stone you know if I think you said you, what was it one heavy session last you said yeah one heavy session yeah one heavy session I mean if your knees are struggling you know that could just make it even worse and I think you know yourself you, every stone session you've probably done except from the last two has been really good yeah. and you that's the confidence you can take into it that the only reason you're not hitting the numbers is because you may be fatigued and you're getting injured and, that, and when you start getting fatigued that's when you go right let's back out to maybe 140 and do a lot of speed speed stuff and just get the technique get the motion going get your body moving and then just leave it for a week and that's you know you'll be itching by then, because you're training stone so much right now, you'll be hating every minute of it, and you're probably getting less motivated yeah. each time. But when you go away from that, you'll be itching to get back onto them. And I think you need to give yourself more than a week. I think like nine to ten days of doing nothing, and you'll be like, 
yeah, you'll be hating like the first two week days. You'll be like, thank God I'm not touching these. But then after that, you'll be like, yeah, I want to lift up the studs now. So. And so then when you're at competition day, you know, on the world stage, you're talking world's strongest man. Now you're going into the free pre and it's like, some, some people say it's not possible. So obviously, you know, and I, I feel like you, you thrive off those people. Like you really do thrive off that energy. But how do you handle the energy where it's like, yeah, of course he, Tom's going to win again. Tom's going to, of course he's going to win again. How do you deal with that? Yeah, I, I ignore, I, I, yeah, I kind of look at the negative stuff, ignore the, because I think I've had it for the, the first year I won it. People say I want to win it again. I won it the second year. But the thing is for me, like I said before, I've not won it, I've dominated. Like I've not been like big headed or anything. The proof's in the pudding. I like won by 10 and a half points last year than the year before I was I think leading the first day of the final by seven or eight points. So like, I'm kind of dominating my opponents. And yeah, people, when like a lot of people come up to me and go, you've won it this year. It's like, well, I've still got a lot, lot of work, work to do. Even when I was getting messages last year before the Atlas Stones even started, I was, they were like, I didn't see them, but I seen them afterwards. Like, Tom, you, you know, you've won this, you've won this, you've won this. But you literally have to realize that anything in the world can happen. And these comments are nice. They put a smile on your face, but I never, ever, I always try and stay humble. I never kind of lower, like lower to a level where I'm like, oh, I can win this. These guys are saying, oh, at this, these random guys on the internet are saying I'm going to win World Strongest Man. I'm going to do it. I'm going to sit back, relax, and not train. I just kind of stay, stay level-headed, stay grounded, and I honestly try not look at negative and positive comments. I kind of just, you know, if I'm putting up training, I will put up training, and if people want to say stuff, they can say stuff. But I always, I, I've got this line, and I know if I'm 100%. Nobody can beat me. As long as I go in 100%, that gives me good confidence. And no wonder, I think that's why people talk that I could win it because I think people that know when I'm 100% that I can be unstoppable. And I proved that I'm Britain, proved that I, you know, well strong as bad as well. So. When, when you talk about like being one of the one of the best, are we talking about being, you know, in the mix? And it's like maybe you're LeBron, Brian Shaw's, Kobe, you know, or is it that you want to be? like the guy, Michael Jordan, like people, you know, say Michael Jordan's the guy, like established as the greatest of all time. I mean, I'm not going to debate who it is, but like, you know, people do say that's who it is. Yeah. Are you wanting to be the greatest of all time or do you want to just be mixing amongst them? Yeah, I want to be the greatest of all time. I think if I wanted to just be like a number of part of that, I'd probably have stopped. I'd probably have stopped after my first title because I'm already in that. I think with only one World Strongest Man title, you're already in that kind of bracket of, you know, been one of the best in the world, one of the best and one of probably the well known, but I want to be the greatest of all time. But I always say it now, like, I don't want to just be the greatest of all time. If I won five World Strongest Man, I know I'll be the greatest of all time at Worlds, but then I want to be also the greatest of all time elsewhere. So, you know, that's for me is to like match maybe Big Z's Arnold titles, or at least win two or three Arnold titles, to win a few Rogues, to win all the big established comps now, because then I, then I know that every competition that I've been at, that my, my name will be at every single one of them. So my name right now is obviously World Strongest Man. When I will start winning Arnold's, it'll be Tom Stoltman, Tom Stoltman at Rogue, Tom Stoltman at, at Shaw Classic, Tom Stoltman. So it's, I want every competition to be known by me, for me, like no one else's name. Oh, Tom Stoltman's the greatest at that show. Tom Stoltman's the greatest at that show. Then I'll live happy. <laughs> uh, one of the benefit, like some people will go, oh, it's crazy that two brothers uh, two of the strongest pla people on planet Earth, and that it's almost unfathomable. It's like the odds of that happening are crazy, but the fact that you were both passionate about st strongman and the fact that you are both gifted as well with uh, the physical attributes you have, but mentally you guys have, have had that as well, is almost a benefit. Like you know, like Luke says all the time, I get to train against the world's strongest man. But h how beneficial has it been for you to have someone like Luke in your life? And you know, you know, you're not not just for strongman, but for guidance in other things as well. And like, how how important is it for people to find somebody? Maybe it's not a brother, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a mentor. Like, how important is it to have somebody like that in your life? Yeah, I mean, I think it's clear to see that Luke's the one that paved the path to where I am now in the strongman kind of scene. Um, obviously, ten years, you know, Luke's had that ten years, uh, sorry, ten years older than me. I think he said to come to the gym because he knew. There must have been something in his head that said, if Tom comes to the gym, he's going to be sitting. And, you know, 
that's what he did. You know, at 16 years old, he took me to the gym. And I, the, the thing that I always kind of look back on with Luke is, I wanted to quit, but he never let me quit. And that's one thing that no one's ever done to me. If, if I got like, if I wanted to quit a football, they would just go, oh yeah, just go, just go. But with Luke, I think he must have seen something because he just said to me, just keep going, just keep going, just keep going. You know, I'll make sure everything's fine. Do you just keep on doing what I tell you, and you'll be you'll be fine. And then, you know, I, obviously, me and Luke grew really close. Uh, he was like my training partner every single day. Um, he just, yeah, I think he just taught me to kind of. I think he taught he blo- he helped me blossom in the gym. I think you know when he went away off on the other rigs, I was there myself, and I think in his head he might have thought, "Oh, Tom's going to quit now," but I think. Having Luke as a motivation on seeing what it kind of did to Luke's body and mindset as well, and to know that like, I just love seeing Luke like hit PBs and you get that buzz and there's nobody else around you t- to like kind of help. Like there's nobody else. You don't have a team. It's not a team game. I just love how it helped develop you mentally and physically and it just how your body changed. I was memorized when I seen like Luke's biceps and Luke's arms. I was like chest. I was like what. The hell, I, I want to be like that brother. I think that yeah helped us get close, and yeah, he's just a motivation. I think every single person knows in the world that Luke kind of saved my life in a way that you know that he probably didn't realise it would save my life. You know, I think when he took me to the gym, I think it was more for me just to be confident and to help me physically, to help me mentally, maybe to meet a girl, and just to make me happy, just to go home and smile and be able to go, oh mum, dad, I've hit a PB in the gym and, you know, do that kind of stuff and that's what really helped, you know, after a year hitting PBs, seeing muscles grow, I was at my first festival people were going, wow, you're big, I was like, wow, this is great and that's all, you always I always look back to, that's what Luke helped me do and then I'm, you know, side by side with Luke, posing with him, all his mates are going, wow, you're getting bigger than Luke and, you know, it's just mentally as well, it helped me develop skills and like you know, academic skills that I didn't really learn in school. It, without me thinking, I was doing like mathematics percentages without even being in a classroom. So it really helped. He it really helped me with that. And I think the big thing as well was how to talk to people and how to come a, come across as like a human. Because obviously, when I first started, Hood was up. All I talked to was Luke. But then to then be able to kind of he then pushed me to obviously physically he knew I was there but mentally he wanted me to be able to blossom and be able to talk to other people in the gym and not be scared and not kind of be that that loner that's just going to the gym by himself and too scared to ask someone for a bit of chalk or someone for that and when when he started you know he started taking the lead but then he let me take the lead and say that you go ask him to do that and when he helped me with that you know you, I didn't you don't really appreciate it until you look back on it and it's like well that's kind of helped me then be able to talk to people being able to talk to cameras being able to then develop in the sport as well because so if I didn't have Luke physically yeah he obviously knew I was going to be great but mentally he I would have just crumbled if I think I didn't have him and I would have just quit when I go and got hard he helped me grow a business together he's helped me yeah he's helped me do everything and I could keep going on and on about everything he's done but I think it's evidence that how we've grown together and how Luke's talked about me how I talk about Luke how we're always so kind of positive with each other we're always kind of you know if he's down I'm down if something bad happens to him he'll share it with me vice versa so you know we don't have any secrets whether he's there for me but he's helped change my life and that's just because of me stepping in foot in the gym at 16 years with him to then develop 10 years later and still go strong I really didn't think in 10 years time we'd both still be doing it I thought one of us would either be like, you know, I thought maybe Luke would have still been like going on our own eggs and maybe his job is more important to him and he let me do it or I thought I would have just probably maybe quit after five or six years but to be able to keep on this journey together and keep believing in each other and keep pushing it's, yeah, it's been incredible and yeah, yeah like I said I owe him loads and I think he knows that I think when I win the World Strongest Man titles like the first year that was the biggest payback I gave him was you know I shared the first memory with him was did it beat Brian Shaw he cuddled me and that was the kind of thank you look I've what you've pathed this path to me I've taken the crown and I'll you know I'll repay you for winning World Strongest Man and helping the Stokeman name get into that like legacy status yeah uh, it was, I mean that was the greatest thank you you could have done like I, that, that moment was just magical you two like the, the there's a picture I think it's in the film actually one of the scenes is you and Luke embracing and Brian Shaw still loading the last stone and it was like like the the image itself just says so much it's just insane uh, just just to sort of finish on that point imagine 
the Lucant take, hadn't taken you to the gym, what would your life be like? Jeez, uh, I mean, um, yeah, I think because I, I put down on my childhood because obviously me having autism, I don't really like to remember things, but talking, you know, the way Luke's talked about my childhood, the way my sister's talked about it and the way, like, my mum said to, like, Sinead and stuff about it, I think probably no, if no kind of fault of families or anything, I may have gone into, like, childcare or maybe, like, somewhere down even worse than that because I know some things and I knew I, I know I was really, really bad at it and I know that, like, sometimes my mum and dad couldn't control me. And also, I think the hardest part was my dad was away for a long, long time. So, like, whenever he came on home, my behaviours would be worse. And I always just thought, because it was just some random... Well, not random person, but I was like, why is my dad only here for two weeks and then going away for five or six months? And that... Yeah, so, yeah, I really think if I didn't find the gym... Obviously, I had football, but I didn't get far in football. I think I would have just gone down into some sort of care or gone something like that because, you know, care was set up for me. I had a lot of support workers out of school. I was working with three or four different people on the weekends. Um, you know, it was... My mum and dad would also, like, a lot of the time, break down. You know, they, they, needed, they needed their rest. And, yeah, it was just... I didn't treat my dad with as much respect as I should have because I thought he was going away to work, to work to be greedy and not because and he didn't want to spend time with us and that's how I kind of seen it so when he came home I kind of misbehaved even more I didn't listen to him I didn't want to do anything he said and that's why I think my mum was my biggest support base but yeah I think I would have probably went down a lot of wrong roads and probably uh, not kind of not exceeded at life I, spe I think mentally I would have I wouldn't have met like a Sinead I wouldn't have met half the people I've met I wouldn't have been able to have this life I probably would have been I wouldn't even had a job, I don't think, so. Right, l last question, Tom. Yeah. I would say, uh, l let's take it from when we first met, but I, I know this wasn't when, it wasn't when the dream was planted, but back then, like, the, the way you used to articulate it to me sounded like you was making the, a decision to be great. Like, at a time, like your your accolades in the sport were good, like they, you know they they were all great accolades, but that you weren't you weren't in contention to be the greatest of all time. You were just a good athlete in in sport, the sport of strongman, and it's like you decided I'm gonna be a great, like that's it. I'm gonna be a great. I'm gonna be I'm gonna go down in history. I'm gonna win world strongest man, uh, and this is my plan to do it. If somebody was starting at the start of that, they were uh, three years ago at that self belief. What would your advice be to be? a great in something yeah I mean if they were starting three years and they had that plan just say yeah just no ifs no buts no maybe say you're going to do it and do it I mean I think for me it's work you have to work hard and discipline I mean you don't get any everyone can talk about genetics but genetics get you 40-50% of the way you have to be able to make a plan but you don't just make a plan and just say oh yeah, in three years, I, I want to be the greatest of all time. I want to do this without working hard. If you say something, if you want to be one of the greatest of all time in a sport, you have to say it, you have to work hard, and you have to chase that dream. You can't let anything distract you. you know, even like, I was, what, three years ago, I was 25, 24 years old boy. I could have went out and partied and did all that kind of stuff, but I sacrificed all that because I know that mindset was, if I become the greatest of all time at this sport, in 10 years' time, I can do, I can have a few drinks and stuff, but I said, if I become the greatest of all time at this sport, it's going to change my life. And that's why I wanted it. I wanted it to change my life because I never had money. I've never been able to afford things. I've never even had a nice car. I've never been able to like do stuff that I've always wanted to do. And I knew that winning competitions like this or being the greatest of all time at a sport would open so many doors. So that's what I say to people is, because people will say to me, you're lucky you've got genetics or you're lucky you're this, you're lucky you're like Luke's brother. I like, yeah, I'm lucky, but also off cameras, I'm we're probably one of the hardest workers in the sport and that's all it is, is there's no shortcuts, there's just basically be the greatest of all time, go prove that you want to be it and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen but you've given your 100% every single year and you've given 100% to every single goal you want to do. I love it and uh, you know like, like we said, some of this interview, some of these clips are going to be used for um, promoting the documentary which will have all the pages and social pages and the websites linked below. Uh, but I, I can't thank you and your brother enough for like letting us into your life for these last three years and seeing, like for, for me more than anything, like, and the reason I want to share this story with so many people is that was the fact that you, you guys said that you're going to do this and then you did it. And like, when we talk about like the business, 
the your capabilities as a strong man your you in particular your personal growth like and how you've changed as as a person um is so inspiring like it's crazy like to think back three years ago like i think even like having conversations was like between me and you was a bit more difficult like and your 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 skills as like social skills got like so much, like unrecognisable. I, I don't think people realise that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was, that's only really three years ago as well. And I think people just think yeah. autism disappears and yeah. like, and I think also, you know, the biggest motivation as well is when when someone says they want to do a documentary or something, yeah, then you know you're like, wow, that's serious. And you, you don't want to, because when, when you say I want to be a documentary, I was like, right, I don't want to, I don't want to be like second or third place at a car. I was like, that's going to make something look crap. Like, for because obviously, documentary, you know, you, I think the main things in that is you want to leave a legacy in it, you want to make a statement and you want to kind of cement your first kind of, you want to cement something in it. And well, when when you said that and I said, right, I'm going to win World Straws, man, that motivated me. Because, you know, if, as our names are out there, you know, if I watch a documentary of myself and I'm third place, I'd be like, f like delete it because I've not, I'm not kind of, I've not achieved what I wanted to do. So yeah, it also helps having, because it's, it's more than just YouTube, it's more than just someone filming. It's like you're, this is going to be something that's going to live with us forever. Let's make it memorable. And that motivated me to go, right, let's win it once. And then, uh, number two, let's win it twice. So if you say there's a third one, I will definitely win it this, this year. And then if you say there's a fourth, I'll definitely win four. Keep going, mate. <laughs> Jeez. But like that, you know, sharing that story of what you said you was going to do and then you backing it up, I think it's the biggest inspiration. For me personally, like it's changed my life it, like immeasurably. It, like the, the, to see you to do that is unbelievable. So I, I can't thank you guys enough. Cheers, thank you very much. Thanks again, Tom, for coming on. No I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll be out in Ohio very soon. Thank you so much to Tom for doing this video with us. Myself and Neve are heading out to Ohio right now to film Tom and Luke at the Arnold Classic. I'll also be doing the Rogue Record Breakers. Personally, I'll be listening the Atlas Stones to try and break the world record as well. Um, so yeah, if you want to see the behind the scenes of that, a lot of the channel members who have joined down below, you will be getting an exclusive look on that. So thank you so much to everybody. Uh, we will be uploading the video shortly so you can see behind the scenes to all the, the members of the channel. And also, everybody who's supported us at mulliganbrothers.com, you made this possible. This feature-length film that we've been filming for the last three years was made possible by you guys. So anybody who bought a journal, a t-shirt, supported the movement in any kind of way, thank you so much. The new poster is available with code STOIC. You can get 10% off at checkout. Uh, follow the link in the description. It's a poster to remind you that you will one day die. It's the most motivational tool I have been using for the last year. I cannot get up and not realize how precious time is. So if that sounds good to you, head to the link in the description. But also, guys, please let us know your thoughts below. Let us know who you want to hear from next. Uh, I love bringing the Stoltman brothers on the channel because we've got this huge project coming out. And I guarantee by the time, when the project does come out, there'll be a huge conversation about what these two have achieved. There'll be a huge conversation of the adversity that they overcame. There'll be a huge conversation of all these subjects and the, there'll be a conversation around what they talked about and what they spoke about. Um, there'll be big conversations around that. Luke and Tom, what they achieved and what they've done. And when you guys see this, it'll be a massive talking point. So please go follow them on Instagram. Um, and if you want to see more people, let us know down below. We are, you know, eyes peeled in a couple of years to do the next feature length documentary. And it is all made possible by you guys. So thank you so much. Have a blessed and productive day and I'll see you in the next one or, or maybe you'll see me on the Rogue live stream at the Ohio Classic on Sunday. Peace.